Okay, due to popular demand, I thought I would do a quick last minute video on how to configure some wide area networks using Packet Tracer. So what I'm gonna end up doing here is I've got two locations. We're gonna have an Indianapolis location over here. We're gonna have a Chicago location over here. We've got a couple host computers down here that we're gonna connect through a switch, which will feed into a router, and then we'll go long haul from Indianapolis to Chicago. So I've added my <clears throat> 4321 routers. I've got one here, I've got one here. I've added two 24 port switches, one here, one here. And then just regular old PCs. That's the only thing that's be configured. I've also added some IP address stuff up here. Boom, boom, boom. So first thing we're going to do is we'll we'll configure the routers by just adding some names. So we'll jump in here and we'll call this Indianapolis. We'll jump over here. We'll configure this by calling it Chicago. So now while I'm in here, remember that you have to add modules to the router in order to actually connect to it. So I'm going to power it down. I'm going to go ahead and add this module that's got the serial connections in it. And then I'm going to power it back up. Much like a real router, when I do that, see, it's going to start booting. So I'm just going to let it do its thing. I'll close that. I'm going to jump over and do the same with the Indianapolis router. Whoops. There we go. So we will power it down, drop our module in, power it back up, and then you got to wait. So hopefully the Chicago router is already powered back up, so we'll jump back in and take a peek at it. Which it is. Okay. So everything's powered back up. What we need to do is we're going to go ahead and make some connections here. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to grab our copper straight through wire. Okay, so I've got crossover selected. We don't want that. There we go. We're going to grab our copper straight through. We're going to go ahead and connect our switch through fast Ethernet port to each of our PCs, also fast Ethernet. See, there's our 24 port switch. Here to here. Very good. We're going to use a faster connection when we connect our router. At that, We're going to grab that gigabit to our switch. And the reason we're doing that is the slowest part of your network is the end of your network, right? So you want your routers and your switches to be connected at a faster connection point than you would your host machines at the end because, again, the slowest part of the network is actually you, not those core switches and routers that are making things happen. So I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. So we'll go fast Ethernet to fast Ethernet. And we'll do the same. Fast Ethernet to fast Ethernet. And then we'll go gigabit to gigabit. Very good. So everybody kind of goes about this next part in their own way. I personally choose to go from left to right. So I'm going to configure the Indianapolis network, make that work. Configure the Chicago network, make that work. Then we're going to have this wide area network that we're going to have to create to encompass Indianapolis and Chicago. We'll do that last uh, to make that work. So we know we'll have full connectivity on one side, full connectivity on the other side, and then we'll link those two together with one wide area network set up uh, to put this thing to bed. So I'm going to configure my router. And remember that routers have interfaces, right? So every interface that you have on the router needs to be configured uh, with its own IP address that's unique. So basically, routers could live on multiple networks, right? Because each interface on a router is a network. So in this particular case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump in to my gigabit, which is what my connector is to my switch. And the first thing I need to do is give my uh, router's interface on the Indianapolis network an IP address. Now, that IP address can be anything I want, but I'm going to go keeping it simple with 126.128.0.1. Now, how did I get that? Well, I gave these IP schemes or these IP ranges in advance, as you guys will when you take the test. And if this was the real world, these would be things that would be pre-set up beforehand. 
So now this is a slash eight IP address, or excuse me, this is a slash eight. So that's a class A, which would be a slash eight, which means that the I, or the subnet mask would be two fifty five zero zero zero. Why would it be considered a slash eight if you're using CIDR? Because it would be the first eight bits or the first byte of the four byte uh, subnet mask or IP address would be dedicated to network, and the other three bytes would be dedicated to host addresses. So that subnet mask would be 255.000, and the one is not required. You don't have to make the router interface one, but it just makes it easier to remember. Now you know that it can't be zero, because that's the network address, and it can't be 255, because that's the broadcast address, if you're using a default 255 subnet mask. So a class A, not a CIDR, okay? So we're going to go ahead and click and turn that port on, and then that is now configured. So the next thing I'm going to do is jump over to my Chicago, and I'm going to do that very same thing. So I'm going to jump in to my gigabit, and this network is 130.000, so this is going to be 130.0.0.1, and that is going to use a different subnet mask of 255.255.00, which is a slash 16 because the first two octets of the IP address would dedicate network, and the last two would dedicate host, which means the first 16 bits, aka the first two bytes, so 16 here, or excuse me, 8 here, 8 here, okay, because remember there's 8 bits to 1 byte, uh, would be dedicated to network versus host. So now that's configured as well, so now we're cooking right along, okay. Now, we're still not working yet, but we're getting better. Uh, and in this one, I do believe I didn't turn the interface on. I didn't. Boom. So we're going to go ahead and turn that on. Okay. So our next step here, and I may not have done it on this one either. Nope, I did. Good. Is we need to go in and actually configure our host machines. And you know that when you're configuring a, an actual PC, it needs to know some things. First thing it needs to know is its gateway. The gateway here is going to be 126.128.0.1. That's the address of its gateway router. Now, it also needs to know DNS, but we're not using DNS at this point, so we can leave that alone. Okay? It needs to know its IP address. We know the IP address can be anything in that 126 network that we created, right? So 126.128.0, and it could be anything, not 0, not 1, not 255. So literally, I could just choose two, and that'll be just fine. Now, with that, though, it's going to need to know its subnet mask, which you guys know would be 255.0.0.0. We could give the PC a name if we want. Um, I didn't come up with a PC name in advance, so we're just going to just stick with PC0 for now. And that PC is good to go. Okay. So now we're going to jump back over here to PC1. We're going to do much the same thing. So we're going to jump in. We're going to config. We need to tell it its gateway of 126.128.0.1. We go to its fast Ethernet. We're going to configure that. We're going to give it an IP address of 126.128.0. And we can't use 2 because 2 was just used for PC0, but we could use 3. So we're going to give it PC3. And we're going to click Go. Now, before we continue, I am noticing that I've got this little red triangle here. Notice over here I don't have it. That means that something's going wrong here, something we don't like. Now, it could be one of many things. So to troubleshoot this, I'm going to jump back in, take a peek at my gigabit, and see what I could have possibly done to make this not work. Because as of right now, it's not looking good. So first thing I'm going to try, I'm just going to toggle off the port, toggle it back on. 126.128.0.1 is good. 255.000 is good. So now this should be working, but it is not. So my next step is to troubleshoot. And by the way, in the real world, number one issue, it's almost always uh, the, good, the good place to start is with the cable. So I'm going to blow this cable up, and I'm just going to connect it again and see if we go gigabit to gigabit if we can't now get connectivity. Which I believe in just a moment we will have. So now why that was, that is a just an epically good question. Turn that off, turn it back on. 
But at this point, I believe we've got some things cooking. So now how can we test this? Well, we can ping the router. So how do we ping the router? We're going to go to PC0, just click it. We're going to go to desktop. And then we can open the command prompt, just like the command prompt that you would open if you were on your actual PC. You would head through, you'd go to your Windows key uh, and literally go to the command prompt and start typing away. So I can go ping, and I just ping the router, right? So when you ping a router, you ping the IP address of the interface that you're interested in. So at this point, we've only got one interface created, so it's going to be 126.128.0.1. We're going to ping it and see what happens we've got full connectivity. Perfect. Okay. While we're in here, might as well check to see if we can connect to PC1, right? So a shortcut, if I hit up on the keyboard or on the arrow or the keypad, that's going to replay the last command that I've entered in. So now one was the router and we know that three is PC1. So if I change that one to a three, ping 126.128.03, we got connectivity. So things are cooking. So the next thing we need to do is jump back over. We'll take a peek and make sure these are, are set up correctly, which they are not set up. So PC2, PC3 on the Chicago network are not configured. Okay. So the first thing we're going to need to do is tell it the gateway. The gateway for PC2 on uh, Chicago network is going to be 130.0.0.1. We're going to then go in and give it an IP address. It could be anything you want except for 0, 1, or 255 at the end. So that's going to be 130.0.0, and we'll just give it a 2. Makes it simple, right? But notice this is a slash 16, okay? This is a slash 16 because it's a class B IP address, right? So the default IP or the default subnet mask for a class B address is 255.255.0.0, which means the first two bits, uh, excuse me, the first two bytes, uh, the first 16 bits define network, and the next 16 bits of the 32-bit address define host. So we're going to go and plug those in. PC2 is golden. We're going to jump over to PC3. We're going to do the same thing. So we're going to jump in. We're going to tell it its gateway. Gateway, again, is 130.0.0.1. Again, why do I know that? Well, the gateway is the router that's going to let us off network, right? And that's the IP address of the interface that this switch is plugged into. So now I'm going to give PC3 an IP address, OK? PC, or the uh, IP address for PC3, we'll give it. We'll just give it uh, 130.0.0. And uh, 1 and 2 have been taken, so why not just go with dot .3. And we'll use that default class, P, class B IP address of 255.255.0.0. So we're going to exit that, and we're going to test it to see if we've got full connectivity. So we're going to jump on PC3. We're going to go to Desktop and Command Prompt. And we're going to try to ping the router, which is 130.0.0.1. And we've got connectivity. Okay. So while we're at it, might as well try to ping PC2, which we know will work because it's just connected through a switch. Right. That's at the link layer level. That's going to be uh, 130.0.0.2. Boom. So we're just sending packets to see if we get a response. We're good. So as of right now, a couple things to remember. When you're talking about creating networks, the networks are the lines, not the devices. So this router is not a network. This line is a network. And this router is not a network. This line is a network, right? So what we need is we actually need a third network here because we need to connect the Indianapolis office to the Chicago office. And once we do that, we'll have ourselves a wide area network. So in order to make that work, we're going to grab our DCE stands for Digital Communication Equipment, and we're going to do that via serial port, right? Because we're going long distance. We're going to go serial port from Indianapolis to serial port of Chicago, okay? Now, you notice we don't have connectivity yet. Why do we not have connectivity? Because we haven't configured the interfaces that these connections have been created for. So now I've given you another network here. Network I've given you is a, is a, is a class C range of 221.10.0.0 slash 24, which is the default subnet mask for a class C address. 
So I'm going to jump into the Indianapolis router. I'm going to go to serial one and I've got to configure that thing, right? So what do I need to do? I need to give the Indianapolis router an IP address that lives on that 221 network, right? So I'm configuring this new wide area network. So to do that, I'm going to give it 221.10.0.1 because that's easy to remember. Now remember, this is a class C. So the default subnet mask is 255, 255, 255, 0. So we've used all three, class A, class B, and class C. That's fine. So I'm going to go ahead and flip this on. And we still don't have connectivity yet. Well, there's some things we need to do still. So I'm going to go ahead and exit Indianapolis router, jump over to my Chicago router, and I'm going to go to serial 1 as well. Excuse me, serial 0. So I need to give it an IP address that lives on that 221 network. We know that zero we can't use. One is used already, so why not give it 221.10.0.2? And that's going to keep that same default subnet mask, and I'm going to switch my port on. Now at this port, at this point, it looks like it's working, but it's not going to work the way we want it to. If we were to try to ping, from PC0 to PC2, even though it looks like it's working, we're not going to get there. So if I try to ping, uh, PC2's address is going to be 130.0.0.2. It's unreachable. And we knew that was going to happen. So the reason it's not going to get there is because there's something important that we don't have. Right? Routers do a lot of things, but one of the things that routers do is they help us decide routes. Now there's two different ways that you can have routes configured in routers. You can set up static routes, which would be a tedious, very, very challenging task to set up a static route for everywhere your computer needs to send a message. Or you can use something called dynamic routes. Okay? So dynamic routes are done through something called routing protocols, and it's just a, a, a language, basically, that routers speak to each other in order to allow them to transmit information and understand how things work. Uh, there are two types of routing protocols. One are called link states, and the other, call, the other is called distance vector. When using Packet Tracer, you've only got one choice. Uh, well, really two, because it can do version two of RIP, but... Basically, uh, the only routing protocol that Packet Tracer is going to let you do is RIP. And that's what's built in. So what you need to do is you need to tell the router what networks to listen for. Not what specific addresses, what specific networks to listen for. So now how many networks do we have? We, you, you count the lines, right? So one, two, three. You've got three networks. The 126, class A the 221 class C, and the 130 class B. So what I need to do is I need to tell this router to listen for the 126.128.0.0 network, and I need to tell it to listen for the uh, 221.10.0.0 network. Oop, it would help if I actually typed that in, huh? So we need to tell it to listen for the 221.10.0.0 network. And we need to tell it to listen for the 130.0.0.0 network. Boom. And we got those all plugged in. 221 network, 126 network, 130 network. So now we need to do that same thing over on this side. So we're going to go over. We're going to go to RIP. We're going to tell it to listen for the 126.128.0.0 network. It's going to listen for the 221.10.0.0 network. And it's going to listen for the 130.0.0.0 network. Boom. So now, sometimes it takes a little bit for this to all start working. Uh, remember, in the real world, routers have to share their routing table and their information because they, they are part of autonomous systems. Hopefully, this will work pretty quickly here. If we've made a mistake, we will troubleshoot it. But we're going to cross our fingers that we will be able to get from every place to every place. Okay. So all I'm going to do to test this is I'm going to start with PC0, and I'm going to see if I can ping the other side of the Indianapolis router, which would be 221.10.0.1, right? So we'll start with that. Ping 221.10.0.1.
and we've got connectivity, so that's pretty good. So then we're just gonna keep going, right? So why don't we try to ping uh, 221.10.0.2? That's the other side of the Indianapolis to Chicago network on the Chicago side. So it's this side of the Chicago router. So I'm gonna change that from one to two. And we got connectivity, that's a good sign. All right, so we're gonna keep going. And now we're gonna jump over from the 221 network to the 17, the 130 network. So we're gonna ping 130.0.0.1. That should be the other side of the Chicago router, right? So this router has two interfaces, which means that this has got its own IP on the wide area network here, and it's got an IP in the Chicago address. So I click it, we've still got connectivity, things are going well. So we're gonna do this one more time. If we change that one to a two, that should be PC2 on the Chicago office network. Uh-oh, PC2. Uh-oh, oh, there we go, we got it. Just to make sure we got it, we'll run it one more time. Now we're cooking, we've got connectivity. So at this point, you're pretty golden, that's kind of it. You can continue to add PCs on each side. So you've got a 24 port switch here. So you could have 22 more computers here. You can have 22 more computers there. These, each one of these routers have two more interfaces. So you could set up two more completely independent networks if you wanted to. But at this point, that's kind of it when it goes to setting up a wide area network at the base level using Packet Tracer. So we'll talk to you soon. That is it.